Welcome to The Authority File. I'm Bill Mickey, your host and the editorial director at Choice. For this four-episode series, I've been speaking with Sarah Shippey Copeland and Lauren Magnuson. Sarah is Director, Desks, and Patron Experience at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga, and Lauren is Head of Collections, Delivery, and Access at California State University San Marcos. This series is brought to you by Taylor & Francis. Now pay attention to those job titles, because they're not just important on their own, they're key to our discussion, which focuses on how Sarah and Lauren and their libraries are altering operations to safely maintain services during the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll hear about what they did, how they did it, what worked and what didn't, and how they adjusted along the way. In this third episode, Sarah and Lauren talk about the elements of their plan that worked really well, and for those that didn't, how they adjusted on the fly. Okay, so I want to get into talking about um, sort of some of the ways you've both adjusted on the fly. In, in other words, what, what has worked and, and what hasn't. Um, but maybe to start, um, you know, I, I'm kind of imagining you both are having to make decisions often on the spot, or, or at least, you know, your, your staff um, it, are as well. And, um, you know, in many cases, there has to be this immediacy necessitated by what's going on with the pandemic. And so I'm curious to, to hear from you how um, you're, you're empowering yourselves and or your teams to handle these in the moment decisions. Um, and Sarah, why don't we start with you with that? Sure. So I think my team, um, just because of their context, um, is already pretty used to making in the moment decisions. Mm, right. Um, and in fact, we, we did have hired two folks, uh, relatively recently and, uh, one had made the comment that, uh, you know, she's just going to start, um, asking for forgiveness instead of permission and that's going to become <laughs> her brand. Um, so at any rate, like this, it's kind of been the, um, culture anyway. Yep. And I think what the pandemic has brought is, um, that, we need to do a better job as a team communicating how we make these decisions to the whole group, or maybe not how, but just like that we made a, an on the fly decision. Um, mm. And the main reasoning for that is just uh, because we can learn so much from each other. Uh, one, we can learn that a thing happened and two, a potential solution. Um, and then as we start to put all these different pieces together, we might see a broader solution emerge or, um, or a pattern or something like that. So, um, uh, that's really been where my focus has been is um, on encouraging the group to communicate the decisions that they're making and and then h helping folks follow up on the loose ends so that uh, we call, all end up flying in the same direction. Great. And then Lauren, how about you? Yeah, I, to I agree a lot with what Sarah is saying. I think um, one of the things that's been very clear in this um, situation is, you know, how much no one at any level was prepared or had, you know, kind of foresight into what was going to happen and what the best right. decisions are. And so it's been, I think, a good opportunity for like, you know, even as a department head to be very open with everyone I interact with that I really don't know if this is the best course of action. Um, and I would love for input on this because I am struggling myself to know that this is the right decision. And I think mm -hmm. when we bring things like that, like, you know what, we got to figure something out like this. And I don't know that I'm right. So please help me <laughs> know that I'm right or, or help right. me at least with the buy-in that we're in the right direction. So I think what they're saying about kind of going in the right, in the same direction by communicating those decisions and talking through the fact that like, we don't know that this is the right thing that brings everybody to the table to, you know, at least, you know, we're all collectively recognizing we're doing our best and there's no decision that seems to be handed down where, you know, people are like, well, where did that come from? It's it's had a effect of, I think, flattening the hierarchy. And I think also, um, you know, I think we're really at the end of the day, all we're really trying to do is really reduce stress on students, but also on ourselves. I mean, letting go of some workflows that are onerous that we just don't have time for anymore. That is 100% okay. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and then just focusing really on what students need to finish their coursework is the priority. Um, and then making things easy, like we you know, really early on did away with things like billing for lost items, um, which is like, 
you know, kind of a win-win for everybody, right? Because students don't get the bills for them. Um, and which, you know, we felt like we couldn't really bill students in that situation where they're not coming to campus and, you know, we're going to tr- do everything we can to get those things back eventually, but it doesn't make sense to bill for them for things. And all the staff work that goes into tracking that stuff, yeah, is right. it really worth it at the end of the day? You know, I think we decided no, and it's such a small amount of things. So things like that, that just, you know, let go of them. And again, like with lots of buy-in of like, should we do this? Is this right? And then all the people who are involved kind of saying, yeah, no, this is for now. This is how we're going to do it. And we can revisit Mm -hmm. that later, but this is what we can live with right now and handle. Right. Excellent. So what have you both sort of observed in, in, in the working culture of your, of your staff? Um, How are your employees holding up? Um, You know, how have, your personal interactions shifted or changed? Um, you know, is there the same collegiality or is it more business-like? And um, Sarah, why don't we go back to you? Sure. So, um, you know, we I'm one of a handful of staff that is on site every day. Um, mm-hmm. Most of our folks are um, in some sort of a hybrid work from home and on site. Um, and that's been really challenging um, for some projects <laughs> because right. uh, like w- when you're used to everyone kind of being on the ground and seeing the same thing and being able to come together in a room to get the thing done, it becomes a much different type of process when you have a distributed team and you can't all see the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um so I, I can definitely say that that those um, logistics have have presented a challenge, um, and then you know you forget how important um, some of the day to day check ins and casual interactions are for just helping yeah. everything go smoother, um, and and helping you achieve your your overall um, plan and goal with with different projects. So, um, you know, I think, I think that's been a challenge and I don't have a solution yet. Um, so I guess I'm eager to hear what, what Lauren might have to say about that. Um, (laughs) and then as far as, um, how employees are holding up, um, you know, at least my team, I think, I think they're getting pretty exhausted. Uh, the university Mm -hmm. in an attempt to discourage travel during the semester, uh, removed all of the breaks. So like there's not a fall break and our semester basically ends before Thanksgiving and, uh, we didn't have a Labor Day holiday. And so that's just meant that we haven't had those kind of built-in breathers either. And then with our rotating cohort, uh, we've got um, approximately 50% of our um, desks and patron experience team on site at any given time. And when they're on site, they're basically staffing the desk. Like there really isn't much time to do anything else. And then yeah. when they're off site, they basically um, end up recuperating. And obviously there are other tasks involved, right? Um, in working remotely, but um, but the on site work takes such a tremendous toll, um, especially because those are the folks who are called upon to deal with the compliance issues and that sort of thing, which um you know, that's never fun. No one enjoys that. Um, and, right. and we miss out on seeing um, all the students. So all the positive aspects of being on site, um, you know, they're, they're just here in such smaller numbers that, um, yeah. you know, if I think too hard about it, I just kind of get depressed. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll, I'll shift over to Lauren now. So, um, so we don't have to focus on it too much, but, but Lauren, what, what are you sort of observing among your staff? Yeah, I mean, I I totally hear what Sarah is saying. I think, you know, we have absolutely, you know, the same sorts of, we're just really missing the the humanness of Mm -hmm. working together, that there is a lot of value in that. And it's, um, so, I mean, I'll just say a couple things that we've done. We we have uh, in my unit uh, every other week, we have like a virtual potluck. And I will say like, sometimes we've just canceled them because we have resumed out. We have had too much Zoom that week yeah. and we just I'm like go outside <laughs> don't come to <laughs> let's not do a potluck on zoom and just sit and stare at each other again like let's go outside and like look at a tree 
Um, because, you know, yeah, that virtual work over Zoom is very exhausting and it is, um, you know, isolating in that way. And so those, you know, virtual potlucks, though, when they do work and when we're kind of like present and we feel good about having them, um, those, those I think have been really helpful and kind of like keeping up with people and letting people have just a conversation with each other. That's not this workflow isn't working. How do we fix it? But it's like, what have we been watching on Netflix or something that, that right, right. is actually really, I think, valuable in keeping people, you know, from just kind of feeling like this work robot that, you know, doesn't ever get to, to talk with another person, you know, at work. So that's been helpful. We did a, like a retreat. We played the online, there's an online Jeopardy game <laughs> that we did about each other, <laughs> like facts about each other. We did that for our, ret- our virtual retreat that we could, you know, we would normally do together. We couldn't do. And I invited one of those animals that you can book to your zoom call. Like it's like a, a donkey on a video <laughs> on a camera came to our zoom meeting and just, <laughs> and just or whatever. So I think embracing oh, wow. like the weird or absurdity of this, like, this is weird. And I'm just going to have this donkey show up at our retreat because, <laughs> you know, it's going to be weird. And then we're going to have play Jeopardy and have, you know, some semblance of fun and humanness together, even if it's online. And it's just weird. I mean, just being real, but like, it's not, it's not typical, but we're doing our best. I think that actually, I mean, as silly as that was, you know, it was a, a way for, just to have a moment of levity because like Sarah was saying, there's just no, oh, break, sure. there's no break in anything. And so yeah. um, once in a while having some, you know, even if it's, it's a little forced maybe, um, but a chance for people to just be themselves. Um, you know, that's, that's, I feel like that's the best we can do. And I definitely don't have all the answers to how to mitigate just the overall sense of exhaustion and the need for a break <laughs> that we need. Yeah. Right. So, so we're not fortune tellers, of course, and and so I'm guessing you know some procedures that you had planned on didn't go as you planned. Um, Sarah, I'm going to jump over to you, and if you can talk a little bit about um, what happened with with your plans for contactless delivery. Sure. So uh, we assumed pretty early on that this would be an important part of our service delivery. And in fact, it was included in the task force recommendations. And um, due to supply issues and everything else, um, we ended up with a set of, uh, I guess I'll call them standard lockers, but basically they are not smart lockers um, and they don't um, connect to our ILS, which is Alma. So um, as a, I mean, that in and of itself would have required a fair bit of planning to get those um, integrated, but Mm. even more than I ever would have predicted um, a set of standard lockers that doesn't integrate requires a tremendous amount of planning. Um, And so it took a lot of time to set up and there wasn't a clear process, you know, like with a, with a set of smart lockers there, they would typically have a workflow kind of built in. Right. Right, Um, right. And we had to build that out for a manual process. Um, and we started with that as the default for all um, items that students ch- or faculty or whomever checked out. And uh, we caught a couple weeks in when we realized that it was really cumbersome and patrons seemed pretty indifferent to it. Um, mm-hmm. And the question came up from um, one of the staff in my department, hey, could we make this optional? And here, here's an idea for how we could do that. And so um, their idea was to um, uh, use the notifications that we were already sending when um, items are available for pickup, um, essentially updating the language in that notification to say, oh, and if you'd like contact delivery, contactless delivery, please let us know in this method. And you know, we kind of took a look at it and thought, huh, that's a good idea and um, implemented it. And everyone seems to be very pleased with it. It's really streamlined things tremendously at the desk. Um, Patrons Mm -hmm. seem to have a much better handle on what to expect. Um, It's a better alignment with our four S's um, because there are aspects of it that are the same and those that aren't the same are simple. Simple. Um, So uh, all around 
uh, something that I would have told you, um, you know, four months ago was uh, absolutely essential for reopening. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> Although I'm really glad we have it as an option because for some folks that, um, that, that really is the best way for them to get their materials. So I am glad that we mm -hmm. have it. Good. And then Sarah, just sticking with you with one more question. Um, if you could talk about uh, the computer lab, um, you know, in, in that case, you, you had a, a fairly complex or what turned out to be complex um, checkout system um, in place. And how did you end up uh, changing that? So um, with, with our um, lab in the information commons, that is the largest lab on campus. And we felt that it was really important to one, offer students the ability to use that lab, but then two, make sure that everything was clean. And mm -hmm. so we bought uh, medical grade keyboards and mice, and we bought three times as many as we actually needed for the space, um, well, the socially distanced space, so that uh, we could have a constant rotation, right, and be able mm -hmm. to right. get them, keep them clean and that sort of thing. Um, and we came up with a kind of elaborate way of checking them out. So um, the mice and keyboards themselves are not actually barcoded. Um, there are tags that are barcoded because we were anticipating a waiting list. Um, like we mm -hmm. were um, taking the lab down to, I think, 30% of uh, its typical capacity and we were expecting quite a bit of demand. So we wanted to have a wait list system in place. And so we... Um, set it up so that Alma could manage that for us. And uh, as it turned out, um, this the lab has not been very popular. Um, and checking out the keyboards and mice from the first floor desk to use at the second floor lab seems like a lot of um, extra work. Um, and mm -hmm. it's certainly not very patron-friendly. Uh, so we had... Um, we had a suggestion um, from uh, one of the folks who helps us out at the um, checkout desk that like, hey, well, could we consider just plugging in the keyboards and mice at the computers and having the students clean them like before they sit down? Um, and this would be in alignment with what students are expected to do like in their classrooms, for example, or their labs. And uh, we ended up talking about it on uh, my team pretty extensively. And I'll admit that I, I was one of the folks who was like, oh, you know, yes, we should totally, um, we should totally just plug them in like that. That would, that would be a much smoother experience for the patrons. And um, in the end, we decided at least for this semester to, to keep our current system um, because we didn't have a good way of ensuring that the keyboards were sanitized between each use. And mm. I think one of our overarching interests in um, our, our whole pandemic operations is being able to stay open, right? And so anything we can do to you know, stop the spread is considered a, a, a good thing to be doing. Um, and I think there was a recognition among the team that students were not likely to sanitize the keyboards themselves. Right. Um, so uh, that's kind of where we are with that for the moment. Uh, I, I do anticipate that that will be one of the first things that will change, though, um, as we move along towards normalizing operations. Um, because uh, even with the low volume that we have, uh, keeping the keyboards and mice clean is a, is a big job. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You just heard from Sarah Shippey Copeland and Lauren Magnuson. Sarah is Director, Desks and Patron Experience at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga, and Lauren is Head of Collections, Delivery and Access at California State University San Marcos. This episode was sponsored by Taylor and Francis. Join us next week when we look ahead to the future and predict which of the new procedures and policies are likely to stick around for the long term and where some tough decisions will need to be made. Because I think, you know, we'll have a lot of campus buy-in or, you know, a cancellation kind of conversation about we're going to have to get rid of some things in order to 
you know, basically allow the library to continue supporting other things that are a higher priority. I think we'll have a lot of faculty understanding about that, but I think it's more like, um, you know, inevitably, even when you have that kind of understanding, once, if, like, say we cut a journal, well, that we start to get new library loan requests for those things. And then how to be, you know, a cancellation in one area saves money, but then there's costs in other areas. And so that's really the um, the challenge there is that how do we make the cuts in a way that is totally sustainable? And I'm, again, I don't think I have all the answers for that, but it's something we're going to have to start thinking about really seriously. If you like what you hear, rate us or give us a review on your podcast platform of choice. And if there's a topic you'd like us to cover, drop me a line. I'm at bmickey at ala-choice.org. As always, sponsorship and advertising for the Authority File podcast are handled by Choices Advertising Manager Pam Marino. And all of our episodes are produced by Choices Senior Digital Media Producer Mark Dirks and Digital Media Assistant Sabrina Kofer. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us.